I'm really happy today to welcome Carol Howe, who's going to be uh, sharing with me in our, in our dialogue. So this is, uh, this is Carol. Uh, uh, Carol was telling me we've known each other since 91, I think it is, or maybe 92, when we were both at the same kind of con conference together. Uh, and part of what we're going to be talking about is her book, uh, Remember to Laugh, Never Forget to Laugh, rather, uh, by Bill, about Bill Thetford. Uh, I read this book uh, several years ago, thoroughly enjoyed it. Very, very well written book, Carol. Thank you for doing this. Uh, and just been a great teacher of the Course in Miracles. He does a super job of communicating uh, what the course is all about. Uh, during the break, which we're going to be doing, we'll be listening to music by Jeff Olmsted. Jeff was the choir director at our church in New York City. Uh, we did back from uh, 1989 to up to 2003. Uh, he did several chants based on the Course of Miracles plus songs based on the Course of Miracles. You'll probably enjoy that. Anyhow, welcome. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. Carol and I have had the opportunity to work together several different times now. And uh, most recently, it was in North Carolina, right? A couple of years ago, two, three, three years ago, I guess it was. Oh, yes, it was in October of 2019, two and a half years ago. 2019, right, right. So Carol's been working around with the course now for quite a long time, since 1977 when she picked the book. And then in 78, she met uh, Bill Thetford, and uh, that began her journey. I'm going to have her tell about that in just a moment. Uh, I also met Helen uh, Shookman, the scribe of the course, and Bill both in 1973 at, interesting enough, Anura uh, at the uh, Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship Conference. Not the one that you were at. This was the one uh, elsewhere, but it was a Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship. And I'll tell that story a little bit, a little bit later on. And uh, Carol, why don't you, let's just begin with you. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you came into the course and about how you met Bill and why you decided to write this book. All righty. Um, the New Realities magazine had mm -hmm. its um, original publication in the spring, April, May of 1977. And we had had a house guest shortly before that. And he sent to us as a house present um, a subscription to this New Realities magazine. And the very first edition that we got as a result of his gift giving was the one that had the very first article about A Course in Miracles in it. And it interviewed lots of folks, Jerry Jampolsky and so on. No, I, I didn't know who any of them were at that moment, but it also included the introduction to the text. And when I read that introduction to the text, it was just like, this is it. This is for me. Now, I had had a good 25 years of trying to find out how life worked and, and reading and studying everything that I could get my hands on, whether it was ancient religions or psychic stuff or whatever. There really weren't workshops to go to, but it was like, so I came, I had a lot of background when the course dropped in my lap, so that when I read that introduction and realized that's it. So I ordered it since the only way you could get it was to order it. And I do remember the afternoon that it was delivered in its plain brown wrapper. <laughs> it was three books. It was late in the afternoon and the sun was coming in the window from the West. Mm -hmm. And I had the very strong feeling, this is the end of my search. And sure enough, that was true. It provided what I was looking for. So wow. that's how it dropped in my lap. I'd never you know, heard of it before. I've got a copy of that magazine in that cabinet behind us there somewhere. <laughs> I, yeah, I have a I have a couple of copies and I have what the cover of it I have framed in an oh goodness, you framed it nonetheless. <laughs> I did, I did, I did. It was like that was an important <laughs> document. All right. And so then, go on. How did you make And the then um, I uh, immediately fell in love with it, devoured it. It was like I had two little boys at the time. So when they were off to school, 
Um, of course, I had other things to do too, but I didn't have a job any place so that I could completely devote myself to this. So I read it and read it and read it. And like everybody else, I thought I was reading it for information. That's not what it's about. Like it's not like reading a college text about something. But I, but I really got deeply involved with this. And then I started to try to recruit my friends to do a little study group. And some of them would look, and it's like, oh, there's too much religious language, or this is too long. Who wants to read all of this? So it took me a few months to find 14 people, myself included, who wanted to meet as a little study group. So we did, you know, starting, I guess, this is probably the end, the latter part. By the time, by the time I ordered it from the magazine, I didn't get it until midsummer because everybody else ordered it at the same time and they ran out of their first printing almost immediately. So it was like the second printing of that first edition that I got. So um started a little group and in the early spring of next year, the next year, which would have been 1978, somehow I got a flyer from the American Humanistic Society, mm-hmm. which I'd never gotten before. I didn't even know what it was, but it said that Judy Scutch and, and Bill Thetford were going to be speaking well, I was such a fan by this time, I, and it was at a university that was way over on the other side of town. This is when I lived in Denver. And it's like, well, we wouldn't have missed that for anything. So off we trek. And when we got there, they had the thing set up outside. Now, nothing on this brochure says anything about an outside event. Well, early May in Colorado can still be really cold. So I may have had some sort of a little lightweight sweater, but they they had a big outdoor stage set up. It was like the universe did this on purpose. Why would a university set up a thing on the outside? So Judy, who was a fabulous speaker, was about an hour and something into her speech. By this time, and there was a good sized crowd of people there sitting out in the open, freezing to death. And I finally said to my husband, it's like, I needed a parka, not some little lightweight sweater. And I said, I, I love what she has to say. And I am so freezing. I'm leaving. I'm going to just go find myself a building to walk inside. So I just looked around and there was a building over there. So I walked in the building and over in the corner of this big room of this random building that I walked into is this tall, handsome man all by himself. And I thought, that's Bill Thetford, because the brochure said he would be there, but it didn't say anything about his speaking or being present. Hmm. But my goal in opening the door was to get out of the cold. I was not going on a big hunt for Bill Thetford. I was just trying to keep from freezing to death. So I went over to him and I've never had an experience like this before of some kind of Ancient recognition is the only thing I can say. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, he has a beautiful voice. And so I thanked him for whatever part he had in the course and so on and so forth. And after about 10 minutes at the outside, possibly not even that long, apparently they realized I started to stampede. Everybody else decided it was just too cold. The big doors opened and pretty soon this great big room was just filled with people. So that was the end of that conversation. And I was just, when we drove home, I drove home kind of more or less in silence, which is not what I usually do is stay silent. (laughs) And I was like, I did not know what to, how to process or what to think or say about this kind of a connection thing. So um, life resumed and, um, a short while later, somebody called me because I had, was sort of at that point known as the Course in Miracles person in Denver and said, did you know that Bill Thetford is moving to California? What I didn't know is when these two stopped in Denver, 
it's because they were making their very last trip. They had made several from between New York and and California to go, are we really going to move out here? (laughs) And so (laughs) this was their final trip. They were making their final arrangements, which is just how they got themselves to Denver in the first place. In other words, it was just kind of a nice stopover place. So um, in, in any event, our, our little group continued, so to speak, and this, and I didn't know anything about this person who called and said, did I know he was moving there? I didn't know how to connect those dots, but it was, and I don't consider myself a particularly psychic person, but I could almost hear Bill's voice in my head saying, come out. I mean, this is so off the charts yeah. weird. Yeah. Well, See, the universe is continuing to unfold this saga. Um, a couple of months later, a very dear friend and a guy who was kind of more or less co-facilitating this group, he didn't really do much except be there as emotional support. He didn't really present a lot, but he was a rolfer. If you know what rolfing is, yeah. deep tissue massage therapy, uh-huh. he actually worked with Ida Rolf. Huh. And he said, I'm going to Tiburon to uh, do some advanced work in the fall. And I thought, what's this deal with Tiburon? I, I didn't even know where Tiburon was at that point. I didn't know it was part of the San Francisco. And with that, it was like, something is afoot here. And shortly thereafter, so I wrote Bill a letter on behalf of Jason, who's now going to be in the same little town he's going to be in as a letter of introduction. And of course, I had no address for him. So I sent it to the Foundation for Inner Peace. And I had no idea if I'd ever hear from him. Well, on Halloween afternoon, I'm getting my little boys ready for the big deal. And the phone rings. Now I don't answer the phone if I don't know who it is. There's too much spam. But then you just answer the phone. And here is Bill Thetford's gorgeous voice on the phone saying, I got your letter about your friend, Jason. And yes, I would be happy to meet with him. Wow. And, are you, and, and are you going to come out too? And it was uh-huh. like, I thought I would fall off my chair if I were sitting on a chair. It was like... <laughs> And I found out later that he had not been opening any mail from anybody addressed to him through the foundation because he just didn't want to deal with it. He was he was just over the whole thing. But something made him open that letter. Nice. So, of course, being way back then, um, a more sort of a polite Southern girl, I probably said no. And the next morning I thought. No, how do I mean no? But after all, this was kind of outside my normal way of being, is to be invited to come to California by a man that I had known for 10 minutes and to go out and visit. I mean, the whole thing was like way outside my normal experience level. But that turned out to be what happened. So we found a time that worked for Jason and myself and Bill and the Scutches and everybody else. And we didn't know about the Scutches at the point. And out I went. And wow, life was never the same after that. Wow. Bill and I became very close friends. He would come to visit my family in Denver, and I would go out and stay with him. Bill was a gay man. He was actually a bisexual man, but kind of by his own acknowledgement, but all of his private life was strictly only with men. And But, but he was attracted to women, not just men. So he kind of self-identified, which he didn't really ever do to anybody. There was not really any reason to be discussing that under normal circumstances, but right. self-identified that way. But in any, but he stayed single his whole life. He he right. well, he had he had long-term partners. Yeah, I knew various partners, kinds, but, but there was never but any. The, uh, but there was never any marriage because you couldn't get married as right, a gay well, person way back, you know during those times. But. Sure. In any event, um, the, the adventures with Bill, and then we ended up doing some lecturing together because Jerry was doing a lot of mm-hmm. lecturing. And so sometimes Jerry and Bill and I 
did some things together and and one time and there would usually be a fourth person well one time the fourth person was ken wapnick oh, so wow. ken and jerry and bill and i did a thing down in san diego for the you know because the universities would put this on and and i was new at this i mean i had only been at this a couple of years when we went down there maybe three years and the night before we all had dinner, of course, I knew Bill and Jerry, but I'd never met Ken before. And I was used to doing a lot of preparation for workshops or classes. I mean, I gave a lot of thought to this. So I sort of somewhat timidly go, are we going to make a plan about what we're going to do <laughs> tomorrow? Because this was a big crowd of people. And Jerry said, yeah, I have a plan. It was like, good, what? He said, the plan is I'm going to go first and then, and I don't know what the order was. So I'm going to go first and then Ken and then you and then Bill. <laughs> and that's the plan? He said, yeah, that's the plan. So this was really a stretch. I mean, it was like there are a lot of things about the course are a stretch, but to go like clueless, for an entire day, a great big auditorium filled with people with like, I didn't sleep much that night before, as you can imagine, <laughs> but somehow it all turned out wonderfully and um, you know, was certainly a weekend that I will never forget. So in any event, you know, Bill and I were very close, very good friends, basically throughout his life. We I didn't see as much of him after the first three years. He was supposed to come have Christmas with us in 1981. We had his presents. We're all under the Christmas tree. And I got the word just a few days. Actually, I think it was the day before he was supposed to fly out that he had had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And of course, couldn't come. And that, that there was a big shift in his life at that point. So I went out there, but he didn't, maybe only one more time did he actually come stay with us in Denver. All right. Wonderful. And then before, before long, you're teaching the course full time. You, you, had, you continue to have your group uh, that you were I, working with? I, I did. And, then, and also because Jerry became a very good friend. Um, several of us started what I think was the fourth attitudinal healing center of, oh. uh, of all of the centers mm -hmm. in Denver. And then I got pretty involved with that because I was in, I was running back and forth between San Francisco. It's just a quick little two hour flight directly between Denver and San Francisco. So I ended up I was listening to Jerry talk to somebody because as he got to be more and more and more famous after Love is Letting Go of Fear was written. And Jerry is not a detailed person at all. I mean, the idea of having to make little plans and decisions and things, and he did not take care of himself in terms of honorariums or anything like that. So I was overhearing him in one of these conversations. I said, Jerry, you do not sound like Mr. Attitudinal Healing because he was getting <laughs> all grumpy and cross and upset because he didn't know what to do about this. I said, I'm going to, we're going to do this differently and I'm going to take over your speaking engagements. His secretary oh. couldn't do that. So, and he was nearly fainted with relief. It's right. like, I'll handle everything. Mary just sent me every single phone call or letter oh that came related to his public speaking came directly to me. I vetted them. I determined whether or not they could really put on a large event, made up all oh, the rules about they had to follow if they were going to have him come. So did that for a couple of years and um, was, was closely identified with all of that little group for several years. Um, in the beginning. In fact, that got to be so much that I couldn't do the local attitudinal healing anymore. I had to just pretty much deal with Bill and the California people. And right. But Bill and Jerry came out when we had our official opening of our attitudinal healing center. They came out to kind of christen it for us, which was wonderful. When was that about, do you know? Uh, that would have been probably 19. I think we started it in 1980. I think 
Mm-hmm. We we did planning in right. the late 1979, but we started it officially in early 1980. So it was like April or May in 1980 when they came out to mm-hmm. be okay. with us for the big pre- public presentation. So I had agreed before we came on that I would spend a little bit of time talking about also uh, the first meeting with uh, Bill and Helen mm-hmm. and how that all came about. So take a few minutes to do that. So I met them both. Uh, in 1973, at a Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship Conference, uh, and Hugh Lynn Casey was the keynote speaker. And as you all know, they had a relationship with Hugh Lynn Casey. Um, I had had my first book published at that point called uh, Learning to Die, and I was doing a workshop at this conference. I was also president of the New York City chapter of Spiritual Frontiers fellowship. And um, Bill and Helen came to my lecture. So that was uh, in 73. And um, I was introduced to them at the end of the lecture. And they didn't tell me anything about the course. They did tell me that Helen had written like, I think they said like an inspirational book. (laughs) (laughs) Keep in mind that I had my first book out. And And Helen was this short little woman with frizzy hair and big glasses. And, and honestly, I looked at her and I thought, isn't that sweet that a little old lady wrote an inspirational book? And <laughs> did I know <laughs> that my book was as nothing compared to what I had done? Uh, so that was in 1973. And then in 74, I wrote a letter which got published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, expressing interest in being in contact with people who are working in the fields of psychotherapy and spirituality, because I was doing some doctoral studies on that at that time. Bill saw my letter and he told Helen that he thought it was a call for her to complete the writing of the psychotherapy pamphlet, which she had started, but she had never finished it. And she agreed that it was. Now, as it turned out, we live very near each other. I was living in Chelsea in New York City. They were over in Murray Hill, or at least Helen was over in Murray Hill and Ken was over in the Murray Murray Hill area of New York. In New York, it's just like in the teens, uh, one on the east side, one on the west side. So I agreed to go meet Helen and Bill and Ken, and Father Benedict Rochelle was also there in Ken's little tiny studio apartment on East 17th Street in New York City on Sunday evening, April the 20th. I looked up the date later. I know it was a Sunday evening. And um, Helen sat on Ken's daybed. It's a tiny little apartment. Uh, because Ken, by my dad, prior to that, was planning on going off and becoming a monk. And he'd sold everything. He would, Nothing was hardly left. There was one sort of interesting, strange thing in the apartment, which was right across from us, which is like an altar, which uh, Ken had built. But this, it was actually a door, like you would use on a closet door or something, which he had painted black. And on that had written the word Elohim in gold letters with a, with a gold star. And that was up over the back of this like altar thing. That was in keeping with a dream that Helen had. And so this was a visionary thing that Helen had seen. Ken made it for Helen. Helen didn't want to take it to her apartment. (laughs) So it stayed there in Ken's apartment. I kind of wonder what happened to that thing eventually. But anyhow, um, that was just our first meeting. And at the end of that time, it was agreed that uh, Ken and I would continue to get together to dialogue. And um, interesting that Helen, right immediately almost after that, within a week or so after that, she said if we talk again sometime, well, I had a little bit of a tragedy. I won't go into talking about her and analyzing it all, but there was a lady I'd been seeing a couple of times who I had decided I didn't want to continue seeing, who got very, very angry and started acting out and, calling me at two o'clock in the morning and letting my phone ring and uh, the other forms of acting out, I will not go into. It was pretty severe acting out. And I was really, I didn't know how to handle it. And I called Helen and said, well, she come and see how I'd meet Helen in Ken's apartment. I would never go inside Helen's own apartment. Uh, Judy was to tell me that there were, uh, her husband, Louie was a bit of a rat pack and, uh, copies of the New York Times spread out all over the place, things like that. So <clears throat> I would meet with Helen there, and this was the first meeting. And I remember very, very clearly uh, because I remember what happened. And 
And by the way, Helen would do this interesting thing when she wanted to make a point. We'd sit near each other. But when she really wanted to make a point, she would reach out and she would tap my knee like that. All right. <laughs> and she did that. And she said, this woman needs your help. And next time the phone rings, you answer it and talk to her. She needs your help. All right. So at that night, the phone rang. And I got up at two o'clock in the morning, answered it. We talked until daylight. Uh, she's still a friend to this day and, and worked it out. It was that just needed attention, needed, need, need, needed a response from me. And uh, it was remarkable how that, how that worked. That was just the, the first time. There were other times after that. I went through a lot of stuff uh, when I was in my 30s during this whole, whole period of time. And what I mean a lot of stuff is uh, I was looking for my wife. I hadn't met her. And uh, so I wound up having like several kind of tragic romances during that time. And Helen was very, very helpful in, in helping me to go get through those. Sometimes I would meet her at Ken's. Most of it was just on the phone. I'll tell you what, one interesting incident that did happen with Bill and, and Helen both. Uh, this was in 1977. I bought a house in Westchester. I'd always wanted to own like a growth center. And I, I found this house. I had the money at the time from the sale of another house. And um, it was totally secluded. You couldn't even see it from the road, maybe a thousand feet all the way back. Two and a half acres in Katona, New York. And um, I, I, I grew up on a farm in Missouri and knew very little about zoning laws. <laughs> I made a mistake. The mistake was I put a sign out front and uh, sort of announcing what I was doing. You know, the Center for Transpersonal Development was what I called it. High Rock Spring was the name of the place. Um, I immediately got a cease and desist order from the zoning board. <laughs> and uh, what had happened was that Helen had told me that she was sorry, but she didn't think this was going to work out. I mean, we were, we were together at Judy Sketch's house when we were talking about this in New York. And, um, but I'd already put, a, I'd already put a, a payment on the place. I'd already put it down. And it hadn't signed a contract yet, but I didn't really like the place. And, but Helen was, no, this isn't going to work. It's just, it's not going to work for you. Uh, well, it didn't work, <laughs> to make it blunt. It's just like, um, I, there was a hearing of the zoning board. I went, uh, all my neighbors showed up, all of them. They all came and, and they were furiously mad at me. I hadn't done anything, but they didn't want this in their neighborhood. And <laughs> if I, I was 11th on the docket. It came up at 11 o'clock at night. It was a very hot night and the air conditioner was broken in the, in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember one of just screaming at me, we don't, you, you got this in our county. Yeah, it, Helen was right. I couldn't do it, but I did do it quietly. I would do weekends with Ken, usually on either Memorial Day and or Labor Day, I would have him come and no advertising, no promotion in the community, no sign, nothing like that. It's all the promotion was done in New York City. And that was just how I continued to go like that. Bill, by the way, the, Bill's part in that was Bill told Helen, this was interesting, as she, she was upset about the fact that I wasn't going to be able to do this. He said, leave him alone. It's okay. It'll work out. Well, he held Bill was right. It, it, it worked out. It never worked out to the degree I wanted it to. And then I did a lot of uh, sponsoring Ken after that. And Ken, interestingly enough, Ken moved very, very near me. A funny thing happened with Ken on that. And then I'll come back to Carol. Yeah. That was that um, as I couldn't use that place, I wanted to get another place. And I looked around. I finally found a place I thought would be right in Crompound, New York. And I called up Ken, kind of excited about the find that I found this place where I thought I could move to, but I had to sell my place first. And Ken said he knew about that place. He had just put it down on it. <laughs> so that was Crompound. And then from Crompound, of course, he went to Roscoe, which turned out to be, I came across the river at the same time. Enough of that. So let's just spend the rest of our time now with Carol. So that was my original introduction. So how's it that you came to decide to, to write the book? And, and why did you do that? Uh, first, I have to say, I didn't realize that they lived in Murray Hill. My older son lives in Murray Hill area of New York. Oh, 
Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Which I'll have to I'll have to find out more about the addresses. Maybe he was close by. Maybe he's close by to where they were. I have to find that out from you later. So East Seventeenth uh, Street off Park Avenue. Okay. Well, I think they're on Thirty Sixth Street. Yeah, that's a little bit further north. Yeah, obviously that. Further north. They look right out over the Empire State Building. Right. Kind of in Midtown. Mm-hmm. So your your question again was well, just tell them why did you decide to write this book? And oh, uh, you know, you it that? was really interesting. In probably in two thousand two, I thought this Bill's life needs to be yeah. uh, documented. In other words, this, and I really felt like I needed to do it. Well. So I reached out to Judy, who was very kind, but basically, in a sense, said, well, we're already doing that. You know, Tam is like collecting interviews from everybody who knew Bill and Helen, and we're going to put this big book together, you know, with information from all of them. So it was like, okay. And then I waited to hear more about it. And I don't know, like maybe for every year or so, I would check in and, well, they've done some of the interviews, but Ken's part and Judy's part hasn't yet been done. Well, no book that was missing Ken's and Judy's input would be a legitimate book. So this goes on for years. And I think at some point, I'm going to, I'm not willing to wait any longer. I mean, I've been waiting for years and years and years. And I realized, I don't know from their perspective, why they did not do their own interviewing and put their thoughts on paper in a timely way, except that they weren't supposed to do it. And I was. Uh So so finally, at some point, and Jerry and Diane were out in, uh, here in Florida, and I was meeting with them, and I said, well, I'm going to just write this book. Bill's life is too amazing to just let it fall through the cracks. Sure. And they said, well, there's another guy who's now starting to write. Um, he's written a biography of, you know, uh, what's his name, Holmes, that was involved in uh, right. so on, Ernest Holmes. Right, and so he writes biographies, and it's like, you know what? Great. And I actually met with him. But he didn't know all these people. I mean, so he might write great biographies, but he didn't know all the players. And I did. (laughs) So (laughs) I thought I'm over letting what somebody else decides is, (laughs) is, is or is not going to happen to get in the way. And so I started the researching and it took prop. I probably started in late 2006 or early 2007, and pretty much devoted myself for a full throughout probably most of 2007, 2008, and a good part of 2009. It was about a three-year enterprise because there were, and just as just as a kind of an interesting, the way the universe works about seven years before I started this, I get a phone call from some guy, somebody I'd never heard of before, who introduces himself as somebody who's just moving to Florida. He'd gotten my name from some psychologist in New York who had some of my tapes. That was way back in cassette tapes days. And I thought, Mm -hmm. I have never sold anything to anybody in New York. I don't know how that happened. I found out later, which was another very bizarre story. But in his process of introducing himself, he said, I used to work with Bill at the CIA back when we were both kids. And it was like, wow. And so we became friends and I saw him periodically when he was in the area. But it was like, I could see that kind of people and information was kind of coalescing. When I talked to him as and through him, I was able to reach two other people who worked with, but they were, they were all kids. They were all in their late twenties way back when the CAA was just getting started. And so it was almost like from long ago, 
things were kind of moving and conspiring and I was meeting the people and the things were happening that this somehow was mine to do. And interestingly, one time when Bill was visiting in my house and I, and I, I find this very sort of amazing and very heartening we were having coffee in the kitchen after the kids were off to school. And he said, I think we're supposed to do something together, but I don't know what it is because Bill was very much an introvert. I was very much an extrovert. We just couldn't think like, what bases do we need to cover that, w- that we would both enjoy doing together? So we just sort of let that. Well, when I started to write his book, He was so present, so to speak, that I realized this is what we're doing together. (laughs) I wouldn't have guessed at the point, at that point, that this is when I'm going to be sort of still in the flesh and he isn't. But I had a very strong sense about Bill's sort of being around, so to speak, And as I say, I'm not a psychic person. I don't see visions or anything like that, but I would just have a sense of things. And one time, I'll give you two examples. There were more than that. I was driving on a multi-lane highway and I was on the inside lane because I was soon going to be turning left. And I was thinking to myself, Bill, I just hope that I haven't forgotten something important that I need to include because I'd made a very long list of various things that needed to be included before I even got started. And there was this reassuring sense from him, like, don't worry, I'll make sure that you remember everything that you remember. And at that moment, my eye glances over into the lane next to me on the right-hand side. There's a car just uh, enough in front of me that I can see its license plate. You know what that license plate said? W-N-T, William Newton Thetford, dash 65. And I don't know what the sixth Whoa. digit was. That's when he died. His initials, he both died in 19, when he was 65 years old, and the course began in 1965. So it's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> You're here. The other one was... Uh, this, this one is not as amazing, but I'm getting very close to the end. And I said, Bill, what is the name of this book? And because I just had it under Bill's memories or something in my computer. And he said, you'll know when you get to the end. And it's like, I am at the end. I mean, I'm, I'm writing the last chapter. I'm just within, I don't know, a few paragraphs. I said, but I am at the end. And he said, you're not at the very end. It's like, well, okay, yes, I'm not at the very end. Well, as I'm just writing and writing and writing, the last sentence just kind of came into my mind that says, in the last sentence ends, and never again will we forget to laugh. And I'm like, <laughs> there it is. Never forget to laugh is the name of the book. You were right. It was in the last sentence. Right. Look. But the really kind of most astounding thing was somewhere getting fairly close to the end. I said, Bill, I keep having this sense that you're here, but I want more proof. (laughs) I want to really know what's happening here. And so he said, and this thought comes into my mind. I'm not hearing a voice. It's just like these little thought telegrams come through. He said, Ask Judy about the plaid dress. Wow. Like, oh, wow. okay. Now, this is so specific. And this involves somebody I know that I thought, I don't know. I was a little nervous about asking her about, did she know anything about a plaid dress? And I wasn't going to tell her why I was asking the questions because I thought, what if she says, I don't know anything about a plaid dress. And then this is like, how am I going to respond if I think all of these sort of messages from Bill Bill are illegitimate in some way? So it took me a couple of days before I sent her the email. You know what? She sent, she said, it sure does. 
and she sent me a picture of herself in a plaid dress and her baby sister, who was nine years younger, was dressed in whatever. This was the first official picture that she and the baby sister had had where the photographer comes and takes the picture of them together. Oh, uh-huh. And it had been a very precious picture to her because that baby sister and her husband were killed in a very mysterious airplane mm-hmm. crash right. years later. They never did discover. They knew where it went down from the, from the instruments on the plane, but they never could find the plane or them ever, ever right. again. Wow. But anyway, I thought, how? There's no way in the world that I could possibly have any doubt about the fact that, Mm -hmm. you know, Bill and I collaborated on this book because we needed to collaborate. It was the work, it was the work we needed to do together. So when, how did you decide at some point in the way that the course was just going to be it for the rest of your life? I mean, the, because of the depth of it? I mean, this is even before, you're just at the course by itself. Um, speaking to you, no? It was like, I could just, well, first of all, it was so meaningful to me. Mm. And, and because I'm kind of a teacher at heart, I guess, or a communicator at heart, mm-hmm. like what would be better to communicate about <laughs> than you something, you know, that is really going to radically change your, it had changed, it continued to change my life and right. the, and all of the, all of the original people involved with the course, you know, Bill and Helen and Hugh and Ken and Judy and Witt and Bob were all such wonderful, dedicated, we're going to do everything we can to do this right and learn our own lesson. So you couldn't ask for um, a more dedicated group of people to hang out with, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we all were kind of doing our part, but there was something inexorable about it. In other words, Mm -hmm. it was like, I didn't plan 30 or 40 years ago. I have to think Mm -hmm. I'm 45 years. I didn't make any plans about no big long-term flow chart about what I was going to do. I just would kept following my sense of, I need to go here. I need to do this. I need to do this workshop. And then I kept getting asked to do a lot of things. So some of those things happened organically, but it's my mission in life. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it was going to be my mission in life other than raising my kids. But, right. and I taught school and I worked for IBM in my early years. And I think that was very important because I try to tell people, this is not about learning more information. This is a rewiring your brain process right. because I had a big, long amount of time at IBM decoding and debugging programs. I know how that works. I know how you (laughs) figure out, like, if this is the response you're getting, and it's not what you want, you go back up through your coding and your logic to find out where is the logic error and change it, and you'll get a new output. Exactly what the course does, especially with the lessons, not only the lessons, but certainly the lessons is a rewiring your brain operation where it will ask you like focus on this, you know, Mm -hmm. put all of your attention on this. It doesn't say figure this out or learn this. So you can be regurgitated on a test. It'd be focus your attention on it. We want this idea to replace the coding that you already have in your brain. This is weird. Or re- because neural, from the time and space point of view, new neural circuitry is created very quickly, right. you know, when you focus your attention on one thing. So what you're saying is uh, miracles, everyone's right, but purification is necessary first. Yeah, re- <laughs> I just think of it as like rewiring your brain. In other words, and, and you might say, well, what is it that has to be rewired? Well, yeah. what has to be rewired is... This is like the one and a half minute version of this Mm -hmm. is if you look at it from the big metaphysical point of view, we choose our parents. In other words, we choose the circumstances. We're told over and over and over again, every single thought 
that you <clears throat> think makes up some segment of your world right. and your life and everything else. So, so we'll just say, okay, once I get myself born into the circumstances <laughs> and the family and the religion and the culture and the century and the country and everything else. Oh, and right. then if we look at it from the scientific point of view, the young of all species, no matter what you are, if you're a human or if you're an elephant or, you know, if you're a raccoon or whatever you are, the only thing that really matters is the survival of mm. the young. And for that reason, the right brain, remember the right brain is the non-verbal part. It's the intuitive, instinctive feeling. And that's what the young need. It's like to kind of, we don't mm. know we're a person in mm. those first three years or so. I'm just having the experience of this feels safe to go toward this doesn't feel, I, I avoid this, I go toward this, I'm, I'm negotiating in my environment. And right. then when I get to be about three years old, the left brain kicks in, which allows me to think. Right. And that's when we start to grow the ego story of me. It's an invented story. Right. But if you can imagine, it would be like if you plant a plant in soil, the roots of the plant are going to pick up through the roots what's in the soil, whether it's nutrients or poison or whatever it is is going to be pulled up into the plant. Well, you might say all of this early experience that I have no way of evaluating, I don't know anything about what's happening. It's like all of that is sort of the soil, so to speak, mm -hmm. out of which this story of me grows. Right. And it is automatically going to have built into the story things about ourselves, and we call that story the ego mind, that aren't true. Right. And we end up with beliefs. This is the tragedy and also what we came to deal with that we think are true, what are only beliefs that kind of stem from not knowing how to evaluate that early experience because we had nothing to evaluate with right. at that stage of the game so that everybody ends up as an adult with, and this is the key, with beliefs that we think are the truth about us of being unworthy or undesirable or nobody cares about us or we can't do this right. right or you have to do this and you can't do that and so on and so forth. And then we learn the defenses for like mm -hmm. what to do, how to handle this thing we've invented. And none of it has anything to do with what we really are. Right. So it's this unlearning of the mythology about ourselves. Right. That is our task. Carol, this is really wonderful. We are actually at our halfway point. So we're going to do a 10 minute break right now. The hush of heaven holds my heart today. The hush of heaven. Hi there. <clears throat> We're back. Buddy, you with us? I am here. Uh, Thomas, what's been going on? We've had a lot of really great questions. I am very impressed with the, the depth. 
it seems from a text perspective that we are bouncing around chapters 23 and 24, just FYI. Okay, so. All right. <laughs> here's the first one. 23 is a great chapter. Oh, yes. Section yeah. two, great. Go on. Oh, yeah. So the course mentions about being above the battleground. It is difficult to do so when we have problems, our boss gives us a hard time, family obligations, etc. How can we practice being above the battleground? Carol, you're the guest, so you, you should go first. <laughs> okay, it's like, it, certainly it's interesting since the title of that chapter is the war against yourself. <laughs> and mm -hmm. So we're having like the big war in the world yeah. played out and the internal war that goes on. It's like one gets above a, gr a battleground when you're not engaged in a battle. <laughs> like when you, it, you, you simply decide, okay, it's like if you were going to take all of those words that the Course says and reduce it down to two or three sentences, it says, remember the tiny mad idea, which we remember not to laugh, the tiny mad idea is a deep, deep certainty that we all have brought with us that we honestly have ruined or destroyed ourselves, that, that we really honestly are guilty. Nothing could be further from the truth, but that is the deep core belief, so to speak, and that that must be handled before you can sort of claim your birthright. And it says, and the way you're going to do that is through relationships. <laughs> it's like, so it says, because your relationships are going to reveal to you what it is you, the specifics of what it is you think is the matter with you. What do you think you're guilty for? What do you think you need to be punished for? And so on. And it says, you can't be healed alone. You can't sit in your house and go, I really am a good person after all. And yes, I got programmed and so on, blah, blah, blah. I have to have a desire, which is going to be very tiny in the beginning, that whoever my troublesome person is over here, we're just asked the question, would you be willing to see whether you call it his innocence or that there's something else going on with him, or that there's another way to see him. In other words, there's no way that I claim the truth about me in isolation. And so, which is why from a psychological point of view, we talk about projecting what's going on with us out here. And so the so-called other people out here who are behaving in ways that we find difficult or horrible or troublesome or whatever, this is where the course is very much in your face, so to speak. It says, if you see it out here, you put it out here. You, the collection of your own unfinished business, so to speak, or your own unloving thoughts or your attack thoughts or whatever they are, are all showing up. In fact, in the latter part of the text, it says the world, what we think of as the world, which is not an objective world, everybody lives in their own world, so to speak, is the ego's self-portrait. So the only way we make any headway is rather than those people out there doing whatever they're doing and being the problem, we've got to reframe the war that's going on and the war is going on inside us. In other words, with things that we believe that aren't true and then, and then it's all downhill from there, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> like, but the, but the the key and the thing that makes this work unique is its emphasis on we're continually being asked, would you be willing with this neighbor or partner or child or daughter-in-law or whatever, would you be willing, and I'm going to add a little in here, to see that with the mindset 
they have going on with whatever they believe about themselves, whatever their history is, that everyone is always doing the highest and best of which they are capable, but because whatever they're doing is in harmony with or um, a, a picture, so to speak, of whatever their own beliefs are. So I think one of the first things is, is that even if you think somebody is horrible with what they believe about themselves, about the world, about their own guilt level, that they're, the burden that they're carrying around, this is the best they can do. And it doesn't mean the best they're going to do ever. It means that at the moment that they're doing something you don't like, that's the best they can do. And it's obviously also the best you can do because you're seeing it projected out there. So the, one of the most important things we can do is to claim and take ownership for all of the elements in our lives. I just wrote an article for John's magazine. It's going to show up, I think, in the next edition about we don't have any private thoughts because every thought we have shows up as some aspect of our lives. There's no way to have a private thought, nor is it possible to have a thought that has no consequence. So uh, it's like all of this is sort of, this is not, we're not asked to take blame but we are asked to take responsibility. You know, the little thing that says I am responsible for what I see and everything that happens to me and everything that I feel and everything else. I ask for and receive as I have asked. And you can go, I just can't buy that. Surely people in war-torn countries aren't asking to be bombed. It's like, well, they're not asking for it at an intellectual level. But in fact, I have some very dear friends who fled Kiev. I have a Ukrainian godson, and they're all living in Lviv right now, and they're, they're doing well. I got a, a note from her just this morning that they now have access somewhat to email service. And, um, but if we can get that, we need to stand back and look at it from the much larger perspective of everything that's in my world for good or for ill, I take responsibility for, not blame, mm. but responsibility for, then I automatically am going to approach things differently. Right. And one of the reasons that I, there were several reasons for needing to write Bill's book. Number one is that he was an incredible human being. Mm. Number two, there's a lot of false information about him. Stories mm. by people who weren't there, they don't know anything about it. There's some stupid stuff on the internet about how he was in involved in all the mind control stuff, none of which happened. I knew the people he worked with. I knew the paymaster who paid him while because he was still working on the, the PAS, personality assessment system, which he started with this when he was with the CIA while he was at Columbia. And I mean, but there's nothing underhanded about that. What people often don't realize is that in addition to being the person who brought the course forward and knowing it very well, Bill was a world renowned psychologist. Mm. He wasn't only known in the course community, he was known throughout the world for his expertise. Right. And that's something that people don't know very well. But being above the battleground means, to come back to your initial question, the, the main battle <laughs> that is going on in our own minds, sure. if you will. And it's showing up in all of our adversarial situations out here our big mistake has been, but you out here did it, or you out here are the problem. It's like, nope, everybody who comes into our lives is like a big mirror. It's like a big hall of mirrors, mirroring to us. And you go, I don't like that. I don't want that mirrored. It's like, yes, we do, because we carry much guilt, listen carefully, that we're not even aware of. We're aware of some of it. We're not aware of all of it. 
And you go, well, I don't want to be aware of all of it. I want it to just stay hidden down there like the nine-tenths of the iceberg. It's like, no, you don't. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because guilt, when we really believe that we've defiled ourselves or hurt someone else, guilt is an immediate request for punishment. Mm -hmm. You'll always get it. It's not like on your computer where you're about to do something and the little box comes up that says, do you really want to delete this file? <laughs> when the universe doesn't say, do you really want to call down punishment on your head by hating that person? It just goes, your wish is my command because we are the power. No. And, and so if we are carrying guilt about how we are afraid we've hurt ourselves or somebody else. And it's so down in our unconscious that we don't know it's there, but it's still showing up as elements in our lives. That's not a good situation. I need to know what I'm carrying with me so I can let it go. Right. Thanks, Carol. I'll just uh, very briefly address that and then we'll go to our next question. You know, you don't have a choice. What I mean by you don't have a choice, if you want to be happy, <laughs> you, need to get a, you need to get above the belt. You need to realize that the truth about who you are. Yes. If you want to be at peace, and you do want to be at peace. And I think if you've been doing the course long enough, you will know that there's another way to see things. So you're just looking for this other way to see when you recognize who you are in truth, in your eternity. You are the son of God. You're the daughter of God. You're the self that you are, and yeah. not that silly ego thing. The exactly. ego thing is going to get caught in all kinds of traps. One of the advantages of doing the course, and I know some of you have been doing the course for a long time, is you become really very much aware very quickly of when the ego's in play. If you realize when the ego's in play, then that also means you have the opportunity to stop it. Yes. You have the opportunity to stop it right now, and you, I could see peace instead of this. Yes. Well, maybe you're not, maybe not, not peace in the world, but at least in your mind, you'll be sane yes. and you'll be able to see peace. And then that also gives you the opportunity to be able to be helpful in some yeah. way, especially in terms of the immediate relationships you've got. Say if somebody's kind of going crazy around you, you don't have to go crazy. You just keep loving them and you keep extending out. Uh, what you know is going to be helpful. Love is the thing. It's always the thing. <laughs> that's, the, yeah. that's the cure. And there's no doubt about it. And it's, it works. So it's really that simple. But what's, what's good about the course is we have all these lessons and all these years. And the more you practice, the more you practice, the better you get at it. So the, hopefully, the, the more peaceful you become. So let's, let's go back to Bud and see what else. Uh, you got, got a lot of great you, questions here. So. Uh, so the next one is Helen used guidance to get a coat. Do we really use guidance for physical things like places to live, going somewhere, etc.? Yes. In other words, I feel like a lot of guidance happens. I I came to Florida because of guidance. In other words, it's like um, it would it would be unreasonable to think that guidance isn't involved in our world of form because we appear to be in the world of form. So, yes, I see guidance. Speaking of Bill's book, it's like Bill was kind of very around guiding, but in many other ways, you know, the people who show up, the opportunity that appears, the, the whatever, it's like it's impossible to think that it's um, random. I, I sometimes get what I call little guidance telegrams. I mean, even <laughs> beginning back um, 30 years ago, I, and I would come into my family room here kind of at the end of the day and just do nothing but sit and be quiet and see what I would get. And, and for instance, in comes this message that says, build a model. I mean, it was like literally like a telegram, build a model that can show people how the what's going on in your relationships is directly related to your own unfinished business. It's kind of like, 
really no instructions about how to do that, but just do that. So I did. And it's like over and over and over and over, just thoughts will come or an idea will show up. And it absolutely is not related to anything I'm doing right now. I mean, it's strictly guidance just appears and guidance will, uh, and it can be about um what seem to be mundane things, or it can be about things that seem to be lofty things. But keep this in mind, at every given moment, every given moment is a brand new clean moment. Remember, and it keeps telling us this, that once a deed or a word is spoken, it ceases to exist. It kind of falls off the radar screen. It's not there. There's not a big pile of transgressions following along behind us, getting larger and larger and larger <laughs> the older we get. It's like, no, there's only this brand new clean moment. And in this brand new clean moment, I have a binary choice. I either can be invested in the care and maintenance and the protection and promotion of my ego, my sense of personal self, what does it need, what does it want, blah, blah, blah. Or in this same very moment, I can be, I'm here to be truly helpful. I have no idea necessarily what truly helpful is, but that keeps you open to, and you might say connected with, you can call it your guidance or your intuition. And oh my gosh, I just can't tell you the weird things that, <laughs> that's, that turn out to be amazing and perfect. But when I would get these thoughts, it was like, what? Really do that? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I couldn't put them in context because I, I was too close to whatever it was. But it was like, yes, guidance is built into us. If we will pay attention to it, it's not like it's out here that I have to randomly go find guidance is in our right mind, so to speak. And it's a matter, am I going to choose to pay attention to it or am I going to get involved? And in, I know what I need. I know what I need to avoid. I know what's the matter with that person. I know how this works. <laughs> it's like, that's just so it keeps it simple if you realize I always have only two choices. Thank you. So I'll address that just very briefly. It's um, one of my favorite lines in the course is the power of decision is your last remaining freedom as yes. a prisoner in this world. Yes. We are always, every moment, at a point of decision, and we are deciding whether I'm going to go. With my right mind or my wrong mind, I'm going to follow Holy Spirit or I'm going to follow the ego. Yes. What we're learning how to do, this is what the atonement is about. What the atonement is all about is we are learning how to breed out, so to speak, the ego. And as we sort of become more progressively able to let that decision making be in alignment with the Holy Spirit, then it's going to be the right decision. And it can be about merry mundane things like, what am I going to eat? Right now, I mean, that, that's a decision we make uh, several times a day. Mm -hmm. And I can just choose something. Well, that, that ice cream would be really nice. But, uh, uh, gee, uh, some asparagus, but also <laughs> I'll eat raw asparagus. Raw asparagus is really good stuff. <laughs> this would work out just as well. So, you know, if we can take it to the mundane level, you can take it up to a much more extended way beyond that. It's just think about what the decision is and watch out for this thing called temptation. <laughs> it would get, get better and better and better at looking at the temptation and recognize that I have a decision right this second. I can go left or right. And I know which one the right, I know what the right answer is. All I got to do is follow the Holy Spirit. Bang, that's the right answer. Absolutely. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Some people may want to come online too here, but in a minute. Yeah, if you want. Yes, and I know we'll have to save time for that. Just got yeah. a, a number of really great questions. Okay. We'll um, try to keep directly our answers directly about Bill. And one is, Carol, can you speak about your experience of Bill's sense of humor as it relates yeah. to Jesus, Jesus's satirical humor in ACIM? <laughs> yes. Bill was one of the funniest guys anybody ever met. 
He had a hilarious right. sense of humor. His timing was uh, amazing. I mean, and he would do this when there would be a group of people and maybe somebody was in from out of town and they were being a little too pompous about something. And he would get a look on his face, kind of like that the insiders know what's going on look, and he would do or say something. And it was like, it would be so funny, but you couldn't laugh because these other people wouldn't know what this was about. I mean, it was like it was like you nearly would choke to death to keep from laughing out loud. It was just he had the timing and the things he would say were just amazing. <laughs> he was a hilarious, hilarious guy. Yeah, very dry. Very dry. He would take something in the course and just twist it around the other way so you know that I am a body, I am sick. Hurry, call the doctor quick. That's right. <laughs> That's a bill That's right. Line. Very, I, I, he was a punster. He was a great punster. He was a, a, a punster uh, almost without limit. Uh, and, and the thing that's important to remember about him is that his sense of humor, which was really very kind of off the charts hilarious, is Bill's life was a very difficult life. It's one of the reasons for writing about him was not only for posterity what happened, but as a role model for the rest of us. You know, when he was a little seven-year-old boy after his sister died and his little baby brother before that had died and his parents were beside themselves, this little seven-year-old boy has to stay in bed for mm -hmm. a year and a half. Wow. How would, how would any of us handle having to stay in bed and he was out of school for two and a half years? And so there were... He had some major challenges that he brought forward into this life. And I think part of the example he gives is that no matter the challenges, you can keep your sense of humor <laughs> and you can come to a glorious conclusion, which he did. Yeah. What else, Ben? Uh, are there any recordings of Bill's reading the course? Yes, there are a few online. There, there was a, a documentary was made a long time ago. Um, a, a friend of Judy Scutch Whitson's was a producer with the BBC, and she said, you've got to get Bill on. Helen was already gone. You've got to get Bill on record, so to speak. And so... Mm -hmm. There was, it, they were on CDs, I presume now they're on some other format, but interviewing Ken and Bill and Judy and everybody. And there are a couple of other recordings that you can find online someplace of, of Bill. I'd, I'd love to know myself. Yeah. You can yeah. find it on YouTube if you try they're typing it down. They should be on YouTube, or um, if you if you wrote the Foundation for Inner Peace, or if you go to their website, they should have that information there. But right. yeah, I, I looked just recently. I didn't see anything that popped up as a direct recording of his, but um, I'll, I'll do a little research. It's, it's not it's like it was like he sat down and did a recording like this. He was recorded, you know, having a conversation with I don't know Jerry and somebody. There's one of them. They're all sitting out on a deck someplace, mm -hmm. three or four people. But, Probably. Um, Probably. but yes, yeah. you can hear his voice. I also have, um, Bill did readings from the course. Somehow I actually have some of those. Mm -hmm. with his beautiful voice, because I incorporated some of them in our big See How Life Works online program. And speaking of voices, I have, rec I have made an audio book of Never Forget to Laugh. If you come to our website you, there, or anywhere else you get podcasts and preview of coming attractions, I have just finished recording the entire text of A Course in Miracles. Awesome. I'm in right, the John. final checking stages, but that will be available as an audio book very soon. Oh, lovely. Okay. So we've got a couple more questions, John. Did you want to? No, go ahead. No. Yeah, okay. All right, great. So um, in your book, Carol, 
you have a story about a, a dog that you and Bill found that was in distress. Uh-huh. And this was very meaningful to the question asker. Can you expand a little bit on that event? Yes, Bill was visiting and we were out. It was sometime when it was nice outside. And for some reason, we were in the front yard, maybe watching the little kids on their bicycles or something like that. And this dog came kind of around the bend. There was a kind of a little curve in the street and was limping and seemed to be in great distress and just kind of walked up into the front yard where we were. And we thought, well, we tried to look on its collar and there was a number, but we couldn't reach anybody until later that night, but nevertheless. So we thought, well, we've got to take care of this dog. And um, and so we took it back to the backyard and we fed it, you know, and gave it water and kind of were with it for the two or three or four hours before somebody answered that number. It turns out that that dog was stolen. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous, pure red dog was stolen from out of the owner's yard and was taken away in a truck and somehow the dog managed to escape out of the truck. And in trying to find its way home, our neighborhood was sort of somehow part of its route of finding its way home. It's not, it didn't live in our neighborhood, but our neighborhood was just somewhere on the way. And it was, Bill was just beside himself <laughs> wanting to make sure this dog was taken care of, but and it was, and we reached the owner, and that's when he told us what had happened. And of course, he was thrilled that we had kept his dog for sure. him. Lovely, lovely. Um, okay, our next question is, can you, and, and this is one of the things that I found so wonderful about reading your book and others that talk about Helen and Bill. And this, this comment is about Helen's difficulty in practicing the course from her knowledge from Bill, because it was challenging once he left, according to your book. So what what was going on there in that space? What, what do you mean challenging before she uh -huh. left? In difficulty in practicing the course, Helen's difficulty in practicing the course. She just, she would say to people, do as I write, not as I do. It was like she found the message of the course very frightening. Mm. <laughs> she didn't like the message of the course. Mm. <laughs> and so it yeah. was, I mean, can you imagine the sort of schizophrenia of being totally devoted to bringing it down? Because she absolutely knew that was hers to do. Yeah. But at the same time, being afraid of the contents and what it was asking of her. I don't know how you live that way. I don't know how she did it, frankly. She did it with difficulty. <laughs> but she did it with difficulty, and 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 she never did make peace with it. She didn't. It was as if trying to live what it said was almost beyond her. But one really interesting thing that I did mention in the uh, book. And that is Bill had made an agreement when he left that at nine o'clock every morning, which was noon back in New York, he would call Helen, no matter come hell or high water, rain or shine, sickness or health, the phone call happened. And sometimes it would be a couple of minutes long, sometimes longer. So sometimes if we were in the same place together, either in Denver or California, he would say, here, talk to Helen. Well, that was a stupid little two or three minutes because she didn't know who I was and what do you say under the circumstances. However, one time in Denver, when it was at the appointed hour, there were three or four other friends of mine who had become friends of Bill, and we were kind of sitting around a little circle. So Bill makes the phone call, and then he said, okay, we're going to pass the phone around, and everybody can say hello to Helen. So we come around to my friend Jason, who was kind of my co-presenter, so to speak, in the early days of, of little course groups. And when he got off the phone, he passed it to the one last person. And then finally, when the phone hung up, he said, 
Bill, I'm just awestruck. He uh, apparently, he said, I can't even describe if this like it was like heaven opened up. I mean, mm. he was using all the language he could to try to describe this was the most beautiful voice I have ever heard. It was like the power of being in a huge cathedral. He goes on and on and on. It's like, what was that? And Bill said, oh, she just does that for people sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it's <laughs> as if, and no one will know if she did it on purpose or if it just happened. It's as if Helen tuned into that part of her, to the reality of her from whence the course came. Uh -huh. Majestic, immense powerful, amazing, loving, all of our adjectives fall flat in <laughs> trying to describe the experience. But so obviously she had access to that, but her ego mind was not going to have anything to do with that. I mean, she just wanted what she wanted, including, of course, Bill. She really, yeah. really wanted to have a romantic relationship with Bill, which was entirely out of the question. The whole Lovely. thing was bizarre and weird. But to show you the sort of enmeshment of their relationship, at one point, he and another fella owned a little house out on Fire Island on Long Island. And because Helen never wanted Bill out of her sight, can you imagine this? It's like, I can't wrap my head around this. She had built, obviously with Bill's permission, she built her own bedroom and bathroom for her husband and herself onto Bill's house. Well, first of all, can you, if somebody came up to you and said, Listen, I want to be around you so much that I'm going to build a bedroom onto your house, how many of us would say, Sure, fine, go ahead? It was like the, the, whatever that relationship was they had where he felt like he had to cater to her in a certain way. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing as saying, Okay, yeah, I guess you could build that bedroom and bathroom. She just did not. So she was was clutching to him and sort of never gave up her hope that somehow Bill would be interested in her romantically. I mean, the whole thing is so preposterous, it's hard to even put it in words. But anyway, no. so she Someone never was... let go of some of those ego things that were important to her ever. Helen was 12 or 13 years older than Bill. Yes. And Bill was gay. It just, that was never in the cards, <laughs> except in Helen's head in some place, but that's the only place it was. Keep in mind, Helen was an intellectual. She understood the course very well. She yes. could teach the course and she was an absolutely wonderful therapist. At the same time, that ego thing just kept churning in there and kept that resistance going. It was a, a, a tussle going on all the time. So that's right. But she could be a very loving person. She was very loving to me. When she was helping, she, when she was on her helping side, she was very, very helpful. And everybody said the same thing, that she was a brilliant therapist. She was very empathetic. She could, in that one circumstance, she could set aside, I want what I want, and be truly tuned into and helpful to and listening to another person. But that sort of almost seemed to be it. Right. I mean, she and Ken obviously had um, did not have the rancorous relationship that she and Bill did, but no. No, she no. didn't have the same demands of Ken that she had of Bill. Right. Uh, you know, I'm aware of the fact that it's already quarter two. And I, maybe some people wanted to ask their questions in person. So uh, can we do that, bud? Yeah, sure. It looks like we've got uh, John raised his hand first. So uh, okay. John Lucas, if you'd like to come off of mute and ask your question. Hey, Carol. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, Fire Island is a gay resort. Mm -hmm. And any kind of relationship goes out there. So that <laughs> probably would have been 
okay <laughs> out there. Um, well, it was okay with the community, but I can't imagine it being okay with Bill. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I find that hilarious. I've spent a lot of time out there. Um, anyway, I just wanted to put two plugs in because I, I've read the book. I read it a long time ago. Um, I was just waiting for an audio book to come out. So as soon as that was available, I listened to that. And during the pandemic, early on, I started to do the workbook lessons with you on your YouTube mm -hmm. files. And, um, you know, a lot of people have recorded those lessons and stuff, and I've listened to them, but it truly, and I, I wrote you a little note about this, it, it truly was like every morning sitting down and having a cup of coffee over. Just a minute, let me shut that off. Oh, wait a minute. Over, oh, let me just lower this. I forgot what I was doing. Okay, say that again. So you have to part, do you want me to go down? Somebody's not on mute. Yes. Um, okay. No. Isabel Crowley. There we go. Sorry. Okay. There you go. Um, anyway, John. those lessons with you every morning, I'm still doing them, are truly, they've made the, um, the workbook so much more personal. And it's truly like just having a conversation with you because you don't really read them verbatim. You talk to me about them. And I've just gotten so much from that experience. I really just want to thank you for that and for the audio book. It's, it's really beautifully done. Well, thank you for letting me know. I hadn't planned to do those lessons, but in December of, I think, 2016 or 17, whatever, like the last week of December, in comes one of these little guidance messages that says, Record all of the lessons with commentary. I go, <laughs> what? <laughs> really? <laughs> this is the end of December. If I start this dude and do lesson one, I can't just stop in April because it's inconvenient to do this. If I do lesson one, I've and I don't know who I think I'm talking to. It's like, really? And it's like, do the lessons with commentary. It's kind of like, and I don't mean in any sort of a stern, unfriendly way, but it's like when that guidance comes in and it's very clear and just do this, I've learned not to ask questions and to just do it. So thank you for letting me know that it was a good thing I listened. It's beautifully done. Thank you. Carol, how do we get your audio books? Or are they all available on YouTube? It, you can go on, no, the audio book, go to my website, carolhow.com. There's a thing that says audio book up at the top and it'll, you can get right to it. Um, and, and it's out in a lot of other, if you get podcasts and other places, it's there as well. Go to Lisa Hamilton. You want to ask your question, Lisa? Hi, good morning. Um, I have to say, um, being a transcriber all my life, I'm a sucker for a wonderful voice, so I can't wait to hear Bill's voice. I'm going straight to you, too. Oh, what I, wonderful. Oh, he had a gorgeous, gorgeous voice. You oh, can't really wait. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found it interesting. I'm, I haven't finished the book. I didn't even know about it until recently, but I'm, I'm in about a third of the way into it. I'm finding it interesting that there's a lot of talk about reincarnation and so I went to the manual for teachers and looked it up, you know, took, gave it a look over. And we talk about it as it's okay if it's a useful concept for you. And I, I had to think about that because there are people that I've recognized in the same way that you talk about having recognized Bill, you know. And um, I wondered if you could maybe elaborate on the, the, the idea of reincarnation in the course and whether or not they, how they make conflict and how they might not. Uh, well, they don't really. I think what they say is to the extent that we think the world of time and space is real, 
in other words, that we don't we we don't see it as a projection of our own minds. It seems to have some sort of reality to it. To whatever extent the world appears to be real, then having one more than one life in this world that seems to be real is consistent. So it says at the time and space level, yes, at the world of reality, where which is beyond the world of form, no, because you're not going in and out of experiences. You're remaining in the experience of the presence of love that you are, which is beyond our ability of the intellect's ability to comprehend, but right. not beyond our ability to experience, which is what the course is about, bringing the experience, not just a better way to say the words. Thank you. Does that makes sense? Yes. Very much. Morris? Hey, Carol. Hi. I just want to say I adore you. Um, <laughs> I started I started listening to your commentaries about three years, three years ago and would find that I'd get it intellectually, but um, this year has been a year where I, I feel it. I sense it. So the whole rewiring of the brain, it's like it's, I'll yes. go, oh, something linked up. <laughs> and, and, yes. and making sense now. But I'm so appreciative. I'm so happy to hear that you are, are reading the course and about to um, have that published. And mm -hmm. I did read the book uh, maybe three years ago as well, but we'll be getting the audio book. But I am here to just tell you, I really love you. I appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you for being helpful. John, you too. I've read a bunch of your books. And um, again, I love you guys. Thank, Thank you for the help Thank that you, you give, uh, in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Stay in touch with us. Thank you. Marianne? <clears throat> Marian, can you come off of mute, please? And would you? you I was clicking the wrong place. I'm sorry. There go. And there's something <laughs> wrong with my camera, but that really is me. And um, I just wanted to know what the relationship was of Dr. David Hawkins to Helen and Bill. Um, he was never, uh, ever around in any of my having anything to do with what I call the first family of the Course in Miracles. Now, whether they knew each other or not, I have no idea, but there was, he was never part of anything. He was never, his name never came up. And I know who David Hawkins is, but I never heard him ever discussed in any of the, you might say that beginning inner circle of the Course. Okay, well, uh, he used, I used to go to some of his meetings mm -hmm. out in Sedona, and he would, he would say, I knew Helen, Bill, uh, Helen and Bill personally, and uh, I, knew, I uh, worked with Jerry Jampolsky and all, you know, all this kind of stuff, and, uh, but I never was able to find any, anything that uh, confirmed that, and it's always puzzled me. <clears throat> Well, they probably met. I mean, they could certainly have met at one place or the other, but he, of all of the times that in various constellations and combinations of what I call the sort of the little first family of the course, mm -hmm. I never heard anybody either refer to him and he was certainly not ever present. You know, okay. so well, I would have no firsthand information about whatever his relationship was, he, he and Jerry could possibly have been on a program some place together or something like that. But I, I, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that for me. Surely. Uh, I love your series uh, on the, um, the, the um, lessons and, uh, and I've, I read the book a couple of years ago, and I thought it was just wonderful. And thank you so much. And thank you, John, for making this yeah. possible. <clears throat> right. How about Susan? 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 Hi, everybody. Go ahead. Um, 
Susan's got a difficult connection. She's got a weak connection, yeah. Yeah. Susan, we're we're not hearing you very well. You may not have very good reception where you're at. No. You're driving in your car and probably going in and out of a cell. Can you hear me? Yes. We heard that. Um, your best bet is to. Okay. Your best Can you hear bet me is now? to. Yes. Okay. Well, then let me go on. Um, so when I'm substitute teaching. I'm asking the, I'm talking to the children, teaching Course in Miracles, because I was lucky enough to be there in 92 when Carol started um, her classes in Orlando. How lucky was that from 92 to 95? Oh, my God. And um, the children, so I teach Course in Miracles in the classrooms, in the city classrooms in Redwood City and San Mateo, California. And so I'm telling the kids, um, of course, I'm sneaking it in. I'm not saying it's Course in Miracles. Course. And I'm saying, now, oh, you guys are good. You've always been good. You, are, you were born good. You are good. You'll always be good. That's what you are. Sometimes we do things that are not good, but that's just our behavior. That's just mistakes. Course correct. Mistakes are for learning. But then they want to go like, well, is Putin good? And my only answer that I can think of, Carol, is just to tell them, well, you know, he's mentally ill. He's megalomaniac. He, you know, has serious mental problems, and then it's up for you, up to you kids to decide if you think that somebody who's crazy deserves to be, you know, put in a mental institution or killed or whatever. And that's the only answer that I can think of to get. Can you think of any other answer that I can give them, Carol, when they ask me about Putin and Hitler? You know, like, the, the people who do um, unkind things or hateful things or horrible things um do that because of their own self-loathing and their own self-hatred and their own lack of understanding of from their own guilt quotient so to speak and so and i've susan does incredible work years and years and years ago she would have kids write out some and she would send them to me and the things that she was teaching these children in these classrooms was fabulous in terms of just this kind of material so i'm delighted to hear <clears throat> that's still going on but whether you're putin or whether you're the next door neighbor keeping in mind your world as you're experiencing it and as you're living in it and as you're is exactly the equivalent of your inner state of mind, not the inner truth about you. Mm -hmm. So that if you feel guilty and you feel hated and you feel whatever it is that those things that you believe, then all of this is at the behavioral level. This is the words and deeds level. What we're asked to say is at the life level, the presence level, the part that you notice is missing in a dead body level, you know, the life level, no one is guilty. Everyone is still as they were created. So our behavior never touches the truth of us. It may hide the truth of us, but it does not alter the truth of us. And so if we can get to the place where we can see anybody's bad behavior, whether it's on the world stage or it's the next door neighbor stage, whatever it is, if we can see it as a call for help, this does not mean that behavior shouldn't be addressed in an appropriate way. That doesn't say, sure, go ahead, bomb all you want. Nobody's saying that about the behavioral level. We're talking about at the, that the most helpful thing we can do is to recognize that underlying all behavior is the immovable, absolute, light-filled, loving presence of everything, everyone, full stop. And that's what we want to focus on. Remember the uh, bombing in Boston that happened about seven, eight years ago, something like that. The Sunday after that, I was to speak at a church and I threw away whatever I was going to talk about. And I talked about the boy in the boat. And I just asked the question, how does God see this? How does God see this boy? You know, God see this is a child of God. 
you know, wounded child of God, a, a child that's gone way off course and done some pretty horrific things, but still the love of God is there. Now, it's, he may be a long way from being able to see that inside himself, but as Carol is really saying, ultimately, we all have that and we can get back to it, but it may be a long journey back. And because the ego is, if the ego goes crazy and starts destroying the world, which it does, obviously, when we get megalomania is taking over and it can do it, hopefully we, and the one thing that's different about this war than any other war that we, it's on television. We see it, we all know about it, which I think provides a more of an opportunity of being able to raise our consciousness of, as a people, as a world, to stopping the thing in a way that it couldn't have happened before. So that's just a little aside. We're actually at the end of our time, I, but we can run over for a while. There's nothing. Uh, that John, we, we have a, a very special reading of the Lord's Prayer by Bill Thetford. Bobby oh. just sent me the link. Whoa. Okay. Do um, you want to do that? You want to? Sure, we can do that. Oh, do, because you got to hear his voice. All right. Okay. We usually close with this, but we can, we can do it now, and then we'll come back and chat for another moment. Go ahead. Let me just remove the spotlights, and then uh -huh. I'll share. Okay. I do re remember one occasion very keenly when Helen came in one day and she was really distraught. She was perhaps more distraught than I had seen her in some time. And this was while we were perhaps uh, somewhere in the middle of the text. And she said, this time it's really gone off the deep end. It's gibberish. It makes <clears throat> absolutely no sense, no meaning, nothing to it. It's absolutely impossible. I refuse to read it to you and so forth. After I had calmed her down, why she did agree to read the material to me. And I might quote the very end of that section. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only our unwillingness to accept your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. At that point, Helen burst into tears. The beauty of the language, the profundity of the thought, and the, in a sense, the equivalence of the Lord's Prayer for the Course seemed to be so clear that this was a statement in the Course very similar to the Lord's Prayer in many of its dimensions. And it made a very profound impact on Helen, as well as, of course, on me. Thanks for that, Bud. I like the way you focused in on that. That's right. When someone asked where that was, that's on page uh, 350 of the course. It's uh, the last paragraph in chapter 16. Go to chapter 17, look at the page, and, and that's where you'll find it. We say it at the end of each of the classes that I teach. We're at the end of our time, but if you guys want to hang on for a little bit longer, um, I'll, I'll hang here for a little bit longer. And, um, is that okay with you, Biden? Carol? Sure. sure. I can uh, hang on forever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tucker. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm unmuting myself. Um, so uh, I, I in, in terms of the Hitler reference and all that, I, 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 I have been trying so hard to convert my friends. And I, I realize that there's, uh, uh, Helen might have, uh, uh, the, the term cognitive dissonance. <laughs> where people grow up with these ideas and, and their egos are so un, unbreakable 
that Kurt Vonnegut summed it all up when he goes, uh, so be it, you know, you, know, okay. the, 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 you, you could do that. But uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the anthropologist in me, the question that I had I'd, uh, uh, expressed to Bud was that um, uh, you seemed to be about my age, but you seem <coughs> ageless. And I'm just yeah. wondering what, uh, how you dealt with the, uh, you have two children, and uh, uh, how you dealt with the, your relationship to their father, and um, also what what did you feel about? Um, uh, I, I I mean, <laughs> I, I just thought it was pretty amazing that in the eighties and nineties that that Bill Thetford uh, w- was uh, uh, you know chose to have a male partner when it was so uh, unfashionable, you know, <laughs> or not. And he was and unaccepted, he, and he was very very secretive about it. Oh, In yeah. other words, it was like uh, when a fellow that became a, a partner for a while when he first moved out to San Francisco, a guy named Jules. And um, it's when I would go out there, sometimes Jules and Bill and I would go out together and, um, you know, for dinner or something like that. And, uh, there was never the slightest clue in public that they were anything other than just next door neighbors. In other words, it's like he learned, as I guess many people did, to be extremely discreet. It was the one area because he was so private about his private life that I, I could find whoever I wanted to interview in I- any other area of his life for the people who were still alive. Some of them were already gone by that point. But I would run into a dead end, Jack Luckett out in California, with whom they were very close in those last years of his life, gave me three names of men that he knew were partners of his. He said, I don't have any addresses. I have no information. I have only these three numbers. And one of the numbers was like a disconnected number. Um, and the other two had no answering machines on them. You just, it was as if I had sort of the universe, shall we say, arranged that I had access to every other department of his life and all the people <laughs> I needed to talk to. This was a closed book. I could not find one single person or one single anybody who could direct me to one person other than Jules that I did talk to. Um, yeah. it, well, that, 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 that's the necessity of that time. But uh, in terms of you, uh, uh, what uh, I, I don't know whether you have grandchildren or, or but what, what, what's, what was your relationship to the, the, your kid's par- or father? Um. I, my children were basically grown. And then I had a very strong, strong, strong sense that it was time for me not to be married anymore. But it was not because I was getting away from something. I could feel that I was being drawn toward something else, which is a kind of a different thing. And I was having an experience which I can say the words but I don't know that they convey anything meaningful. And that is, I could feel something dying inside me. In other words, I had completed that part of my life. And I honestly do believe that if I had done the polite thing or the acceptable thing or taking care of, in other words, if I had stayed, I honestly don't think I would have survived. It's not that I was having any symptoms. I wasn't having any physical symptoms, which is why it makes it so hard to describe what it feels like when everything looked perfectly normal on the outside world, but I could feel I was dying because it was now time for me to be someplace else. So I think it's important to know, and it was important for my children to know, that one was off in college and one was soon to be, that I was not leaving because, oh, I'm mad I'm leaving. I'm leaving because this chapter is over with and I am impelled to move toward this chapter. And I'm so glad I did. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so it's so weird because the, the the new hip term now is creative uncoupling. And, 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 well, that's and, probably what it was. And <laughs> and I would go back every couple of months. I was in Nashville for about nine months working on a project, which turned to be the kind of the interim step between Colorado and Florida, although I didn't know any of that at the time. Um, and I would go back about every two months or so. And, and he was never, ever interested in the course. He was also, he also had, did not ever try to dissuade me. He was supportive that I could just do anything I wanted to do in terms of the counseling work and the teaching work and the attitudinal healing work. He was supportive of my doing what I wanted to do, but it was not of interest to him. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was just time for that to come to an end. So, so did you did you remain uh, uh, in contact with him? And did the did the kids uh, still see him too? Yes, or? absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. One child was off at college, and the other one still had a year of high school to go. So the two of them lived together. And but what was I was very proud of him because on one of those early trips back, he said, you know, I just cried and cried when you left. And I was so sad when you left. But he said, I realized it forced me to do some things and take some initiatives in some certain ways and to reach out in ways that I never would have done before. And I was so proud of him for having, first of all, the wisdom to see that he was the beneficiary in many ways of this as well. He wasn't a victim of this, that he, that it pushed him into an expanded sense of himself. Let's go to Monica. Can we go to Monica? We run, uh, see what Monica's got. Thank you, Tucker. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Carol. Hi, John. Uh, I met uh, both of you in uh, Utah for the fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet both of you and uh, Bob Rosenthal. Uh, it really got, um, it was wonderful to meet all of you in person. Uh, anyway, I always feel like um, uh, we get the most out of when we hear like personal experiences and I remember Carol. She, uh, you told us about your stories, your travelings uh, to to Russia. And um, not long ago, you sent us. Uh, I received an, an, a video from you. It was very helpful. So I always feel like it's very helpful, like to hear like personal experiences. And uh, so first, I want to ask how, since it's so personal to you, now you have a family uh, in law that it's from Ukraine. So since it's so personal, how was how is being your process of looking this differently above the battleground, literally? And and second, I want to share something personal so we can take it from there. OK, so, of course, I was having like a hard time in the beginning uh, to see this differently and to look at. Uh, Mr. P <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a loving way. It was very difficult. So I prayed for the Holy Spirit to see this differently. And it was interesting. Above, among all places, I, I hit TikTok, you know, and they had this video. It, it was a bunch of, um, uh, of uh, little video cuts, uh, him meeting um world leaders, you know, and how they, when he was going to shake their hands, how they would just turn around, you know? So I, I believe that this TikTok video was like either, either making fun of him or saying uh, like an aggression, you see, see, this is how we have to treat this man, you know, like don't even, you know, address. And because I had pray, I thought that was an answer for my prayer. So when I watched that video, all these world leaders just pretending he wasn't there or when he's going to, you know, like, you know, and they would like turn back. I felt so sorry for him. Like I saw him as a little boy mm -hmm. being bullied and and I felt so sorry. I mean, I was about to cry. I, I, I saw him as a boy that was being bullied by everybody in school, you know. 
And so nobody addresses this. And then he becomes a leader. And even her Hitler one time, he wanted to be an artist, you know? So, so it, I felt like this was his opportunity to show to his school buddies, you know, who, you know, he is, you know, and what a better way of getting attention by being bad because it's so much easier for you, for us to get people's attention doing something bad than doing something good, you know? So I, I kind of understood all of that. And, and actually I look at him and I don't feel, uh, even though I, I cry when I see things from the war and I, I know somebody personally from Ukraine, like, but that was the answer for my prayer. At least I don't have hate when I see this man. However, I don't know how to take it from here. You know, like I, I don't see him with anger, but I don't love him. Uh, so it's just help to take it from here. So I was looking inside. I say maybe there's part of my childhood that mm, I feel hurt. So, so I don't know how to take it from here. And yeah. <laughs> hey, well, what we're asked to do to take it from here is we're asked to say, we all agree that not only he, but all of us have engaged in words and deeds which are unloving. It's a matter of scale, but all of us have been selfish or we've been hateful or we've been inconsistent or we haven't kept our word or we've, we've been into our own self-aggrandizement, like whatever it is, everybody has done that. And the step that we're asked to do is to go, Yes, we're not going to pretend like any of that isn't there, but we're going to say two things, whatever it is we see. Now, see, people are going to see different people when they look at Putin. Some people see, in other words, there are as many different Putins as there are people looking at him, so to speak. So people are going to see different people. And we're asked to say, would you be willing to see that the truth of him, not the words and deeds, human being walking around as a body kind of thing, but the truth of him, would you be willing to see that that is undefiled? That is oh, yeah. not in the game here, so to speak. That, that that reality of him, the part that, as I mentioned before, and some the part that has disappeared or appears not to be present when you look at a dead body, that part is still the presence of love. It's non-corporal. It's, it's above anything that we can uh, access in our world of time and space. But it says, would you be willing to see that our ego words and deeds do not have the power to corrupt the truth of us? Mm -hmm. So it, it's already a fact that we can't corrupt the truth of us. The question is, are we willing to acknowledge that? Are we willing to want to see that? Are we willing to want to act out of that? And so, so as I ask you that question, because you will be representative of everybody else, at the idea of, would you be willing to see that there is light-filled innocence? Not innocent person, like innocent as an adjective, mm -hmm. but innocence as a noun. Would you be willing to see that that is the absolute rock-bottom truth of him? Right. So what comes up for you at being presented that question? question we all need to ask out of our hills it is, it is not hard for me to to feel his innocence okay well then that's your answer in other words you go okay nobody's trying to whitewash what he's doing right. that's not on the table but for our sake right. as well as his do we want to see that the, the God in us, the love in us, is not in this dogfight, so to speak? 
that that part of us is undefiled, because here is the inescapable fact. To the extent that you go, nope, his words and deeds have got more power than God itself and has ruined God, has ruined love. It's like what you're saying is, and that's true for me as well, because what's true of one of us is true of all of us. And so you go, do I really want to subscribe to the idea that I am so, that my guilt is so overpoweringly huge and immense that I've ruined love? It's like, do I want to convince myself of that? Of course not. We're trying to undo guilt, not pile more on. And so the way we decide to interact and to see and to think about somebody else is exactly, we will be the recipients of that. So if you decide to hate somebody, well, then that hatred will accrue to you. If you decide, okay, we're taking the behavior off the table now we're looking at the life presence awareness as he was created part. Am I willing to see that's untouched? Mm -hmm. So it gets to be not what he's doing or not doing, but what is our willingness quotient to see that our mistakes haven't touched the truth of us. This is a matter, you might say, of the size of mistakes. You might say, well, but I'm not nearly so bad as going off and bombing cities. And it's like, no, probably most of us haven't done that. But we sure have probably bombed some people along the way in our own minds of not liking anything about them or what they've done or they shouldn't do this or why do I have to put up with them or whatever it might be. So keep in mind that whatever thoughts you hold about his badness or goodness or or uh, whether he's ruined himself or not or so to speak you're calling down upon your own head right. <clears throat> okay. that's a very good answer yeah it's it's like a magnifying glass of whatever yes. happens inside it's of it's a myself. mirror it's a mirror and in this case it's like a funhouse mirror that makes you much fatter than you really are. <laughs> it's kind of that kind of a mirror. Right. Thank you. Okay. Hey, it's uh, <clears throat> 22 after. Then you want to <clears throat> say something and then I think we're going to wrap up. Oh my God, this has been amazing. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, John. And all of the mighty companions. It's time to read a quick poem that Carol was just talking about. Okay. I call it Putin. Can I see your image as a child of God when no limit on cruelty taps at your heart? So deep must I go to know you in self, seeming ignorance of spirit that has touched all minds. The veil is strong, your pain explodes. Parable of fire seems uncontained. So hard to place this child of God as I gaze on what appears as form. Our light, our love, devoted past stories. In trust, I bless you, past the veil. Very bless good. your heart. Yeah, very nice, Glenn. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to say that my darling friends over that are now hanging out in Lviv, um, who used to live in Kiev, have a wonderful attitude about this. In other words, they're coarse kids. They're, I mean, I call them kids. <laughs> they're 50s, <laughs> they're uh -huh. my kids' ages. The um, that seeing the what could come out of this. In other words, they're they're already programmed, so to speak, to see what's helpful about this, what's good about this, what they've how they've gotten their lives sort of reorganized over there for the time being until they can go back and so on and so forth. Yeah. So um, even the people who are living in the middle of this can have a great attitude. A phoenix will rise out of the ashes. It happens every time. 
Yes. And, and something even better will come as a result of that. Yes. This is a remarkable part, right? Yes. All right. So thank you, Carol, very much for being with me today. And oh, thank you all beautiful. for attending. I uh, appreciate it. So thank you so much for being here, Carol. We usually end with the Lord's Prayer, but we already did that with uh, Bill. How nice. Any so parting we, words, Carol? Or you wanna... Only um, thank you for allowing the course to pull you in, so to speak. And it's worth every, every um, moment that we spend with it in, mm. con in taking full responsibility for our lives and realizing I have all the power in the world to keep changing my mind and thereby changing the outer world. I mean, I'm doing my, we, we all do our parts that way. And um, in the final analysis, all is well. Thank you. And help is everywhere. That's a great line. Yeah. I love it.